everyone. I'm happy to welcome Matthias back to talk about some cool things related to uh, some advanced uh, tenant and admin management regarding the Power BI API. We'll actually learn some cool features uh, using Visual Studio and actually connecting to that and seeing how we can interact with the Power BI service in a lot of unique and interesting ways and maybe even see a few automations. Uh, do you want to give a bit of uh, context on what we'll be going over today, Matthias? Yes, absolutely. Uh, thanks for having me again. Mm -hmm. It's always a pleasure. Um, people who know me, uh, know that I'm uh, very interested in automation uh, and uh, any uh, can be scripted. Uh, and uh, uh, that means the, the Power BI API uh, provided by Microsoft mm -hmm. is actually a, a big deal. Uh, however, I found, and I think many people would agree with that, uh, it's not uh, super easy uh, figuring out uh, yeah. how to use the API, what it can do for you, and how to get started. I recently discovered an extremely useful uh, power uh, uh, VS Code extension, um, which I think helps enormously in, in terms of using the API uh, interactively. Uh, and I basically wanted to share my experience with it, and, and hopefully people will uh, find it interesting. Yeah, let's dig into it. I'll go ahead and switch over to your screen here. OK. All right, fantastic. Um, so I've got VS Code open here. Um, in fact, uh, if you've seen other of, uh, of my presentations, uh, that's usually where we end up. Um, and um, uh, we need to talk uh, about different authentication methods uh, when it comes to the API. Um, let me just start off um, by showing uh, this page. Um, we'll obviously share a, a link to that um, as well. And um, uh, this is the official Microsoft documentation for the Power BI REST APIs. Um, and uh, the uh, APIs are uh, uh, provided uh, uh, on, on the left-hand side in terms of different groupings. Uh, so you can see, for instance, uh, uh, API endpoints related to data sets are all available here. And you can also see there's a very large number of groups um, and uh, items in between. So this is place in terms of documentation. This is your go-to place mm -hmm. in terms of finding uh, what's possible. So uh, let me show you one example. Um, and uh, let's look at uh, groups, which is the f legacy uh, term for workspaces. Uh, so if I wanted to use the API in order to find uh, any workspaces uh, I, uh, I have access to, um, I would go to this one, get groups, um, and um, uh, looking uh, down here, you can see uh, there's a HTTP endpoint, um, and uh, you have various uh, parameters uh, defined. And uh, it's, it's all relatively technical, basically. So uh, if you then wanted to use this um, uh, yourself, uh, the, the question is, um, well, uh, how do I get started? Right? And so this is basically what I wanted to talk about. Um, and let's switch over to VS Code. Here we go. Um, uh, what I'm using today uh, is uh, a VS Code extension called REST Client uh, mm -hmm. uh, that's open source. Uh, it's got nothing to do with Microsoft or VS Code uh, itself. Um, and um, uh, as you can see, two and a half million downloads, so it's relatively <laughs> popular. And um, uh, recently, uh, the developer, I'm not going to try to pronounce the name because uh, it's uh, it looks quite complicated recently the developer um, uh, made an uh, update which um, allows us uh, to use the power bi api in a, in a very comfortable way um, so let me show you what that looks like uh, when the extension is installed um, it will recognize two additional file extension within VS Code, uh, .htp or .rest. Um, uh, they're both um, doing exactly the same. 
Um, and so if I then open a file with the .http extension, mm -hmm. um, uh, you can see we're getting some nice color coding here. So just coming back to the example we were talking about just now, uh, I want to um, uh, uh, get a listing of all workspaces I've got access to from the API. Um, and uh, what have I done here? So first of all, all API endpoints um, have in common this base URL. Uh, in fact, if I just switch back to the uh, Chrome window we were looking at uh, just now, we can actually see that, right? So this is um, um, always going to be necessary uh, uh, as a starting point. Uh, the extension um, allows us to define variables, um, making uh, it very easy for us uh, to actually be, uh, uh, define this in one place and, and then just refer back to it. So basically down here, I'm referring to base URL, this particular variable, and then I'm saying slash groups. And the other thing the extension does for us is this. It puts a very uh, convenient uh, hyperlink uh, just above this get uh, uh, request, which when I click it, as you can see, mm -hmm. will make the call. Um, and it will then open a, a new side panel, uh, giving me the uh, results from my API call immediately. Uh, that's pretty much all uh, that's needed uh, in terms of getting started here. Um, and uh, uh, as you can see, it was super quick, super easy. Oh, yeah. Uh, and most importantly, because I can put this into a file and save, uh, I can very easily reuse uh, the, the various um, uh, calls here. Now, um, there's a little more to it, obviously. <laughs> so course. you can see uh, uh, the authorization line here. Obviously, in terms of using any APIs, uh, we need to authorize. We, uh, we need to make sure the API endpoints knows who we are. And this is actually where the extension comes in uh, and, and uh, where the extension uh, does something super useful for us. Because uh, the extension has built in support um, for what they call an AADV2 token. So that's basically mm -hmm. support uh, to, re uh, to receive um, uh, a valid um, access token from Azure Active Directory. Um, and this is the feature I was talking about earlier. This is a feature which mm. um, uh, was only added recently to the extension. Prior to that, um, that wouldn't have been, um, well, actually, it would have been impossible. Um, so what do I have here? Uh, let me show you. Uh, if I just make this a little wider. In fact, I can close this because uh, uh, we, we can reopen this. Um, so authorization is a standard HTTP uh, request header. Um, the uh, Power BI REST API requires um, a bearer authentication uh, mm -hmm. authorization token. And uh, this syntax here, basically anything that uh, comes up in double um, curly brackets is what the extension, what the REST client extension uh, supports. So we're saying generate an AADV2 token for me, uh, use this particular scope, uh, and use that particular client ID. Um, scope, um, in this, in our case, you can literally copy paste what I've got here and we'll make this uh, code available. This basically says, um, I want to have, uh, an access token, which the Power BI API will recognize. So this is basically, um, a constant. This, this is what we'll have to specify, uh, so that, um, AAD knows um, which service we're aiming uh, to talk to. And gotcha. client ID is uh, an application which I've registered um, inside um, mm -hmm. my own uh, Power BI tenant. If I switch over here, uh, I'm logged in uh, as a uh, tenant admin, and uh, the application we're currently using is that one. Uh, I if there's an arbitrary name, Power BI API delegated, 
we can see 3A51. Uh, that is the, the same GUID I referenced earlier. And there are two requirements here, um, which are quite important. Uh, first of all, um, uh, I did specify allow public client flows. Uh, without that, um, it would not be supported um, uh, uh, by that extension. And, um, and that by default is disabled. So you have to make sure uh, that you actually turn this on when you create a new um, application. Secondly, we need to specify some permissions. Um, and uh, uh, you can see um, I specified three Power BI service uh, permissions here, data set, report, and workspace, read, write, all. Um, and I've also uh, provided admin consent for those, which means that uh, any uh, user in the tenant can actually use that application without having to explicitly uh, provide uh, consent again. It's just um, a way of uh, simplifying this. So with all of that in place, um, we get uh, what we've just seen. And um, I've actually... Um, <laughs> Uh, 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 I've, I've actually um, uh, cheated a little bit uh, because I had uh, this uh, <laughs> uh, session of VS Code open uh, be before we started the call. Um, what would happen when you make the very first call uh, is that obviously you need to um, authenticate uh, and you need to provide uh, uh, your, your password and all of that. Uh, uh, because I had done that already, the extension uh, very conveniently uh, cached um, the uh, access token for me. And so we didn't actually see this. Uh, however, um, what you yep. can do uh, whenever you want to um, uh, force uh, a, a new access to token to be created for whatever reason, you can actually put new in here as a keyword. And it has to be in this uh, specific um, position. It has to be um, uh, right after the $AAD v2 token. When I mm. now click request, it will uh, completely discard what's currently cached and it will actually run me through the authentication flow. So let me just show okay. you what that looks like. Uh, so this is what's coming up. Um, the extension uses what's called a device code authentication flow, um, which uh, basically means uh, it's going um, to uh, uh, redirect me to my standard browser. It's then going to ask me session identifier for 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 my mm. um, authentication flow and. Okay. Uh, 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 I'm then going to go through normal Azure Active Directory login, um, which will ultimately uh, come back to the um, original client. So if I click sign in, this is what's happening. I'm going to microsoftonline.com device auth. I'm being asked to uh, paste the code in here. Uh, the convenient thing is that it will already be in the clipboard at that point. I'm mm -hmm. going next. And then um, my normal um, um, AAD um, login uh, flow will come up with, uh, which people uh, probably have seen before. So yeah. if I want to log in as uh, Matthias, go continue. Now I'm done here. I can basically uh, close this tab. I can go back to VS Code. I can say I'm done. And there we go. So now it's received um, the access token, and any subsequent requests I'm now making will actually uh, uh, use that same cached access token, which means what I've just done was only necessary once for each session. Um, so we've already seen this is what uh, get groups does. Um, if we go back um, to the um, uh, official documentation for get groups, we can see there are some optional parameters um, which um, I can provide. Uh, sorry. Um, and links for all these will be down in the description for everyone tuning in as well. 
Yeah, absolutely. Mm. So there are some option parameters. I can specify a filter. I can specify a top and a skip. Um, and um, if we're looking at the uh, definition of filter, uh, what well, there isn't uh, very much here. Um, but if we scroll down a bit further, we can actually see an example. Um, get a list of workspaces using a filter example. If I click on that, um, we can see that we're using a contains expression. Uh, but the uh, syntax for that, by the way, is the uh, default OData syntax, uh, if you yep. want to look that up. So I've got an example here where I'm using exactly that, because you can see the user I just authenticated with actually has access to uh, a very large number of uh, workspaces. Um, using uh, the filter syntax uh, and actually using a name equals expression in here, um, I can make the same call uh, and uh, uh, specifying one particular workspace name, right? So uh, a use case would be, I know my workspace name, um, however, I need to look up the ID for it because um, I need to reference the ID in other API calls. Um, and again, this is where the REST client um, extension comes in super handy because I can now pass this particular value, which is the one I'm interested in. I can, I can read that from my response and I can put that into a variable which, which is then accessible to subsequent calls. And that's precisely what I'm doing here. Uh, so uh, basically, this is my uh, GET request. Here is my authorization. And then down here, I'm specifying a new variable, um, add workspace ID. And uh, I'm referring uh, to this particular request, uh, having given it a name. And then I'm saying, from the response uh, and the body, uh, give me uh, the ID um, uh, property from the first item in the value array, right? This is what's called a, a JSON path expression. Um, and that now means that this value 5C32 and so on and so forth is now actually available inside here. And um, even more conveniently, when I hover over, um, again, this is what we're getting from the extension. It's even showing me that. Uh, so when I now go uh, to another call that references this variable, like so, um, um, I am now able to receive uh, to retrieve all reports um, uh, inside this particular workspace. So this is another um, API uh, endpoint. Um, if we go back to the documentation, I'm just going to switch back here for a second. If we go to reports and say uh, get reports in group, th this is precisely what I'm doing right now. Mm -hmm. So slash groups, group ID, slash reports, report ID, just switching back now. And um, then um, over here, I see there's currently one report in this particular workspace. It's called report two. Um, it's linked to uh, a data set. Uh, and uh, it's it's uh, it's got an ID as well. Obviously, mm -hmm. um, I haven't spoken about auth uh, authorization because this is literally exactly the same. So you can just <laughs> copy paste it. Um, and now I can go one step further here and can say um, I now want to um, access information um, about the data set linked uh, to the report. Um, I'm doing the same thing here. I'm passing the response body to get data set ID and data set workspace ID. And I can now um, call this API endpoint, which is uh, get data set users in group. So I'm referencing this particular data set and I'm uh, asking for all users to be returned. So in this particular case, I've got four, I've got mm. uh, two app users, I've got one group and I've, I've got one um, individual user. This happens to be the one I'm currently Locked in this. Um, so that's um, uh, a, a, a run through um, uh, of one particular scenario. Uh, we've seen how to specify uh, individual API calls, um, how to use the 
AAD V2 token, um, let's call it macro, um, uh, provided by the uh, extension. We've seen how we can use variables, uh, either um, with static values or with um, uh, uh, response uh, specific values and how we can basically, you know, create a whole sort of uh, workflow here um, by literally uh, starting off from Microsoft's API documentation, grabbing um, what's specified here, and then just pasting it into a script file. Um, uh, any other way of uh, trying to achieve the same thing would definitely be much more um, involved. Uh, Postman uh, is uh, obviously uh, an app uh, or a client uh, many people are familiar with, um, but uh, if you already spend um, a lot of time in VS Code when it comes to um, uh, 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 developing, then uh, I think it's extremely convenient when you can actually stay in the same tool to make some API calls. Um, however, there's more. Uh, unless uh, you've got some questions, Reed, or anything you wanted to add here. I'm just loving the, the the simplicity of being able to like relatively obviously um, to be able to set up and then start extracting out a lot of the the information. I think it exposes it very easily. And uh, to you know, from my experience of dealing with clients, it's like anything API can kind of be scary because it, it's you know like that mm. you start digging into code and stuff. So I, I think this the, this shows not only the, the the accessibility of the connection, but then also the I'd even say the readability of the outputs, just to be able to get uh, uh, good quality data and uh, and information from your tenant uh, mm -hmm. right out, and then be able to pop that in in anywhere else to uh, to use that for for administration uh, analysis mm -hmm. or or however you'd want to use it for your organization. Absolutely. Uh, as I said before, I personally use the API a lot. You know, for instance, as part of KPI tools. Um, being able to actually test stuff out and script it and, and see what works and what doesn't in this particular way is extremely useful uh -huh. uh, and, and valuable. Um, so I, uh, when I started, I said um, uh, there were various authentication methods uh, for us uh, to think about. Um, in fact, there are actually four um, uh, different flows uh, which um, are possible as uh, in respect to the REST API, what we've looked at is what I call the workspace delegated flow. So what does it mean? Uh, um, delegated um, is uh, I'm logging in um, with specific credentials interactively, right? So this is the flow uh, we've looked at initially when uh, the device code popped up and I had to move over to my browser. Um, and uh, had to then uh, log in and all of that. Um, and uh, I called this workspace because um, using this particular method, I basically only have access uh, to any workspace I'm a member of and, and the artifacts within the workspace. Uh, when it comes to APIs and automation, what we usually prefer to use are service principles. Uh, service principles, uh, basically allow us um, to uh, completely get rid of the interactivity part in here when it comes to authentication um, and to effectively uh, use uh, a username password that's assigned uh, to a process or, or, or to an application. Um, and that's also supported uh, using uh, the extension. And it, in fact, it's actually supported in a very nice way. So let me show you that too. If I switch uh, to this file, and if I uh, show you, uh, let me just close a few tabs here. There we go. Um, so this is actually exactly the same file we looked at earlier. Uh, however, what's different is the authorization header. Uh, in fact, it's much simpler now. Um, we're still specifying we want to have an AAD v2 token, and now all, all I'm saying is app only, uh, as opposed to client ID and scope. Um, so this is taking advantage of another feature, which uh, comes from the 
um, extension. Uh, if you look down here, and in fact, let me just make this a little bigger. If you look into my status bar in the bottom right corner, um, uh, uh, you've got uh, this field which allows you to actually specify a profile um, which is predefined with um, service principle authentication details. So this is um, um, uh, what the extension is calling an environment. And as you can see, I've got five entries in here, local and production are just some uh, uh, um, placeholders, but down here, uh, I'm actually specifying uh, uh, credentials for three different service principles which are set up in my uh, okay. tenant. Um, so if I select this one now, you can see it changes down here. When I now make this exact same request, I'm immediately going to get a result back. Um, I will have no interactivity, so I don't uh, have to uh, go through a, an ex, uh, explicit authentication flow because the uh, credentials are already um, uh, uh, configured. Uh, and uh, otherwise, it's the exact same call, which means uh, using the get uh, groups uh, endpoint, I'm now getting all groups this particular um, service principle has access to. Uh, if I go down here and use the get groups endpoint with the filter, same thing happens. Um, I only get uh, the particular workspace of reference by name, and uh, down here I'm getting the ID uh, uh, mm -hmm. passed into my internal variable. I can then do this one as well, where I'm uh, getting all reports in this particular workspace. So again, um, uh, exact same, uh, uh, exact same uh, uh, API request. Just the authorization is different, and as you can imagine, this is obviously a, a scenario that's much more interesting when it comes to automation. Um, so just um, one. Uh, well, two points here. First of all, where are the um, credentials defined? Uh, you can see in here, I've got a settings.json file inside my uh, inside my current working uh, folder. And this is one bit where it, the, the extension is not configured in an ideal way yet. Uh, <laughs> sure. You can also see me. <laughs> um, I'm making my window slightly narrower here because this one actually has all my credentials um, uh, verbatim. Uh, so all, all my credentials are actually uh, provided inside this file. So I'm not going to open this up all the way. Uh, so th that way uh, you can not see the, the full secrets here. Um, but this is basically where it's coming from. Um, and currently, and I think we need to uh, you know, work with the extension author, uh, there, there is no more secure way <laughs> available of, of actually defining those secrets. Uh, I, I'd love it um, if, if it were able um, to actually grab those from my machine environment, for instance. Uh, that's not currently supported. But again, it's an open source um, extension. And uh, 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 it's definitely something uh, th that, um, that people could work on. So. Um, the uh, uh, three different settings we've had earlier, this is where they come from. Uh, you specify tenant ID, um, you specify client ID and client secret, uh, which is what defines the service principle. And then app uh, URI, that is the um, resource ID. Um, uh, 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 with respect to, uh, to the Power BI API. So that is exactly the same as what we had earlier uh, here, where we specified our scope. Um, and so that's the uh, VS Code configuration. Um, the other place where service principles uh, come into play are one, in, in the Power BI admin portal, um, you need to uh, 
go here to developer settings and make sure that service principles are allowed to use Power BI APIs. Um, and uh, here we go. And by uh, following good practices, uh, I've got some specific security groups uh, defined here rather than um, making that feature available to the entire org. So I've got Power BI API principles, Power BI DevOps principles, two different security groups. Mm -hmm. And um, the if we look at those, so if I go here to groups and if I go to uh, Power BI DevOps principles, we can see that uh, the service principle I've just used is actually specified here. So with all of that in place, just switching back here, uh, this flow also works. And um, uh, that is, uh, so that allows us to use all API endpoints, which basically require the authenticated user to have certain permissions within uh, Power BI. Uh, and usually, which is why I called this the workspace scenario. Usually, the permissions are defined at the workspace level. Yep. There are two more um, scenarios which are also supported, uh, which I called the um, admin scenarios, and uh, they are very interesting actually, and uh, allow you to have a tenant-wide um, access uh, to uh, everything that exists inside your Power BI tenant, uh, provided um, you have uh, Power BI admin permissions. Uh, so just going back to our API documentation, the APIs I'm now talking about are all the ones uh, listed right at the top um, under the admin heading. So they they look like um, they're uh, just uh, some endpoints uh, similar to all the others, but they're actually very special. Uh, uh, everything inside here, um, again, uh, gives you full admin access to your tenant. Mm -hmm. And there are two different flavors here. Um, anything um, that starts with get. So for instance, get apps, as admin or uh, get data flows as admin or uh, what else do we have? Um, uh, get groups as admin. Any Anything uh, that's a get, which is basically uh, just fetching information, um, that is accessible uh, to service principles. And that's a very interesting scenario because it means you get full automation and you don't have to worry about um, uh, login flows. Anything that makes changes, so for instance, update user as admin uh, on pipelines or uh, post workspace info, or uh, what else do we have here? Uh, update group as admin. So anything that isn't just receiving information, but actually changes something in the tenant, that is not accessible to service principles. Uh, that is only accessible using interactive logins and only accessible um, to a user with Power BI administrator mm. permissions. Uh, so this is very important um, to keep in mind. Um, and it took me quite a while to actually figure out you know, the subtle differences here. Um, so let's take a look um, at uh, those. So first of all here, um, I've got, um, uh, I've got an example uh, where I'm referencing an admin endpoint and uh, I'm specifying uh, scope and client ID, right? As opposed to app only. So this is uh, what will trigger an uh, uh, interactive login flow. Um, because I haven't used, uh, well, actually, uh, I, I have used this app uh, previously, so it's uh, it's again, it's it's cache my credentials. Um, let me just show you uh, what it would look like 
without the cache. So same thing happens. I'm getting this code. It's redirecting me to device auth. Um, and um, I'm going to show you, first of all, um, what won't work. So I'm going to I'm going to log in with a user that isn't um a Power BI admin. I'm I'm just going to log in with a normal user like so. Uh continue. Here we go. And uh, if I then say done There we go. What I'm getting now is a 401 unauthorized, right? So 401 <laughs> basically means you don't have uh, the permissions required uh for this particular call. Uh and uh, that shows um, anything that is under slash admin uh, does require a user with uh, the, the Power BI admin um, permission. So if I do this again and use uh, the correct user now, which is basically this one, PBI admin, continue, and then confirm. So now I'm getting a 200 OK. Um, and now I'm actually getting results um, uh, for that endpoint. And what did I do? Admin capacities, right? So yeah, so this is now listing the capacities I've got. So uh, uh, I've, got, uh, uh, I've got an A1 here, which is currently suspended. And I've got a PP3, which is um, premium per user capacity, uh, which is active, right? Mm -hmm. So um, uh, that's that. Uh, if I then, I just noticed I haven't updated this yet. So if I then go down here and remove the new, it will use my cache token. And it means I'm now getting a list of all my data sets uh, across the entire tenant. Um, and I'm getting that because I've authenticated uh, with a uh, Power BI admin um, user. And if I do the same thing down here, um, this is uh, a listing of groups um, as an admin user. Um, with an interesting feature. Um, so I'm just going to click this first. Uh, this is something which is only available to admins. As far as I'm aware, um, you can specify dollar expand, uh, which then allows you to basically retrieve all workspaces, including uh, uh, any of their contained artifacts. So this is a very convenient way of basically fetching everything uh, that's in your tenant. Mm -hmm. So here I've got one workspace called PBI Tools Demo, no surprise. Um, then I've got all underlying reports listed. I've got all users listed. And uh, I don't happen to have any data sets here. Um, but uh, 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 again, this is uh, an uh, admin only endpoint. So uh, what else? Uh, I can do the same thing for reports, but um, uh, obviously I need to make sure I update this. There we go. Sorry. Right. Uh, so this um, allows me to retrieve all tenant-wide reports. Um, there are currently 37 here. Um, and just to wrap this one up quickly, um, uh, the uh, um, sorry, let me just uh, go here. Uh, the admin uh, endpoints are also available for service principles. However, uh, very important, um, uh, only get requests are actually possible here, right? Uh, so I, obviously, I haven't shown any demo where I'm doing an update or a delete. I could have done that using the delegated scenario. Uh, with the service principle scenario, that's not possible. Now, the important thing here is that I actually specify a service principle um, which has the required permissions. I still have my DevOps service principle um, specified here. Um, that one does not have access um, to admin endpoints. So when I click this, mm -hmm. um, 
again, I'm going to get a 401 unauthorized, and uh, that's expected. So what I need to do is I need to go down here and I need to specify my read-only admin service principle. When I now uh, send the request, I'm getting a response, I'm getting a 200 OK, and uh, that one again will show me all my capacities. Uh, and obviously those are um, exactly the same two we've seen uh, previously. Uh, the same works for get data sets as admin, uh, get groups as admin, uh, and so on and so forth. Um, and uh, in order for this to work, there's a slightly different setting necessary in the Power BI admin portal. It's not the uh, allow service principles uh, uh, setting we looked at earlier. It's uh, in fact this one. Under admin API settings, we've got allow service principles to use read only Power BI admin APIs. Um, and um, uh, that one, again, uh, has a security group defined Power BI read-only API principles. Uh, if I go to that one, Power BI read-only API principles, I've got one member in here, I believe. Uh, yep, that one. And that's the service principle I specified using the environment setting. And that uh, actually makes it possible uh, for me to use those uh, API endpoints. So uh, even though we're using the exact same admin endpoints, the, the pre prerequisites for those are quite different. For a service principle, it needs to be defined in the Power BI admin portal. For, for the delegated scenario, which also supports uh, writing on top of reading, um, uh, we need to have the Power BI admin Active Directory role uh, on the user. And um, uh, yeah, those are basically the four different scenarios. Excellent. Um, as, a little, as a little bonus point, um, <laughs> I wanted um, to show uh, one further item, which is this one here. Um, this is, I'm a little reluctant to show this, but uh, this is uh, this is this is this is unsupported. So uh, maybe we 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 put we put a bit a, a big unsupported uh, uh, header here. Um, Give it a little little, I... little disclaimer for that one. There you go. <laughs> exactly. But while it is unsupported, it's extremely valuable and extremely useful. So that's why I want to show it. So basically. Um, uh, when I used my delegated scenario earlier, um, I had to define uh, my own application, uh, which I, is then referenced here, right? So, uh, so this client ID, 3A51, and so on and so forth, that's something I had to set up uh, in my Power BI tenant. And I can show you what that looks like. Um, so if I go back to my tenant settings, and go to app registrations. Um, I've got uh, this one here, 3A51, Power BI API delegated. We looked at this earlier when I talked about um, how it was set up. Now, obviously, that is something which only um, uh, uh, Azure AD administrators can do. Mm -hmm. And I appreciate that uh, many people will have this as a, as a very hard um, restriction uh, for their own tenant. Um, and uh, basically uh, will be uh, quite limited here in terms of even uh, getting started using the API. This unsupported feature uses a Microsoft provided client uh, where this particular um, GUID uh, refers um, to an application that's already in place that, and which you don't have to define yourself. And uh, most importantly, uh, this application, uh, I've also got it here for reference, um, is already uh, uh, pre-authorized for all uh, possible API endpoints. Um, and um, uh, Again, big disclaimer here, uh, right? This is not officially supported. This is not documented anywhere. Uh, this is something which Power BI uses internally. 
However, again, it's super convenient, uh, particularly when you don't have access uh, to, to your um, AAD tenant. And um, um, what that looks like, I'm just going to put you in here to uh, make sure that uh, it's actually patching a um, new token for me. What that looks like is this. When I go here, it's now saying Power BI Desktop. So this is actually what the Power BI Desktop uh, uses internally whenever it um, uh, talks to the API. Um, and uh, again, it, it has the huge advantage that all possible uh, scopes are already consented to, and you can basically use it against any Power BI tenant. So if I then go here and confirm, uh, and go back and say, I'm done. It will make the call and here we go. Now I'm getting a 200 and uh, I'm getting the exact same results without um, actually uh, needing to set up my own application first. Um, again, this, this GUID uh, is basically what it is. Um, big disclaimer, don't uh, write. It, it could change uh, at any point, uh, not, uh, documented or supported. However, um, I can also tell you that uh, this particular good has been working for, for several years now uh, without any changes. So take that uh, at your own risk, basically. Yep, I think it's it's a, it's a good uh, playground uh, to explore, but as you kind of mentioned, the, be, be wary of maybe putting that into anything production or that might be client facing, especially if it becomes something that is uh, relied upon um, just because it mm. in, it's not an officially supported uh, feature. Mm -hmm. There we go. Um, so basically, as you can see, five different ways of accessing um, the Power BI APIs. I hope that was useful. And uh, um, when th this feature became available in, in the REST client extension, I was extremely happy, and I'm almost using it every day right now. So. Um, Hopefully, you'll find it um, e equally helpful. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I would say the um, uh, if people have more questions on this or or, or anything else um, in terms of uh, either the APIs or some of this implementation. Uh, uh, are you available to contact? And if so, what are like uh, what's the best method to to get a hold of you? Um, if people have uh, uh, want to know more, find me on Twitter and send me a message there. Um, okay. Uh, let me just show you. Uh, 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 here we go. That's my uh, Twitter profile, M-P-H-I-E-R-B-A. Um, that's uh, where I'm most active in terms of uh, engaging with the community and definitely the uh, best way for you to get hold of me. Perfect. And uh, that'll be in the description. And also, it's right below his name um, in, yeah. in the video feed here. But otherwise, uh, th this was incredibly useful, I think, for the the individuals who are doing any kind of uh, administration or governance for Power BI, it shows them uh, yet another way to be able to uh, to extract some of this essential data out of there um, and and explore it a little bit. And I think it uh, it helps remove a bit of the uh, the, the scariness of the the black box that, that can be that when you can um, start consuming this useful information and then spit it into whatever any system that they might use to analyze it at that point. Perfect. Thank you so much for coming on. Um, and uh, once again, I uh, excited to have you on again at some point uh, for individuals as well. Uh, there probably was a link at some point that popped up on this video that links to the tutorial series that uh, Matthias did with me recently as well, which is on his uh, Power BI tools um, utility that is available available for Power BI that helps you uh, do kind of a CI, CD, and DevOps uh, um, deployment uh, either uh, with, with Power BI desktop files, either to GitHub or to uh, Azure DevOps. So I would encourage you to check that out as well if you're uh, certainly, if you're into any type of administration or are even considering exploring the APIs that like you've checked out in this video, that would be a useful supplementary video to check out as well. Mm -hmm. All right. And the uh, five script files I've just been using, I'm, I'm going to make them available on a public GitHub repo. Mm -hmm. We'll put the link uh, into the description here. Obviously, minus uh, the, the client secrets <laughs> and all of that. Yeah. And, um, and so that should be a good, um, a convenient way for you to get started. Perfect. Sounds great. Uh, Matthias, thank you so much for coming on again, and I appreciate the, the walkthrough on this. Thank you so much for watching. Please don't forget to like, comment, or share this video. 
Plus, if you have any comments for a future video, go ahead and add that to the comment section down below. Now, if this is your first time to my channel or you want to see more of these awesome videos, please click that subscribe and notification button. Also, feel free to show your support by becoming a channel member.